following program is fueled by Monster Energy. I'm a regulator first and foremost. When we're going to have a fight, my job is to have a level playing field to make sure everything is done by the rules for the fans, for the betting public, for the fighters. Fighting both MMA and boxing is not a street fight. This is a fight between two skilled combatants. There are rules. If you didn't have rules, it would be chaos. Without the regulation and the commission, I'm absolutely nothing because the commission is the rules, the boss. We have to live with rules. We live with rules in life. And when we don't follow the rules in life, what happens? We get in trouble. received a letter asking for a hearing for Mike Tyson for relicensure. He will get his day in court here and have a very fair hearing. Mark, uh, what's it like to have the UFC and the family, so to say? Oh, I'm very excited. It's a, a tremendous crowd, a live crowd. Uh, they seem like they're enjoying themselves. It's a wonderful night. When we first moved to Las Vegas in the late 50s, the population was 50, 60,000. The strip might have been five or six hotels, so it, there was a lot of desert. The first fight I ever saw live was outdoors at a venue called Cashman Field, right in the middle of the infield where they set up the ring, and I was in the bleachers. There was something about it, no matter how sometimes violent a combat sport could be, there's a beauty to it. That was the start of my love affair. The sport of boxing has been so important to the city of Las Vegas. I mean, before the Golden Knights and before the Las Vegas Raiders, the only real sport that I think could call Las Vegas its home was boxing. Back in the day, it was very fan friendly. Like literally the best fighters in the world would be training and you could have access and you could just sit there and watch. In those days, the camps were open and I would watch Sonny Liston train. He had this glowering way about him, and he looked mean. I asked him for his autograph, and didn't say anything. He was not gruff, but he signed it. But I could see that it was painstaking, and it took him, I would say, two minutes to write his name, because he was probably illiterate, probably never learned how to really write. And the next time I saw him, maybe a month later, he had mimeographed autographs, and he was just ripping them off to give to people. Sonny Liston had already knocked out Floyd Patterson in Chicago probably six months before that. All of a sudden, it's coming to Las Vegas, the rematch. I bought four tickets, $10 a piece, top row of the convention center, completely sold out. It was really tense when they come into the ring. Everybody was so excited. And then it was over. Floyd got knocked out in two minutes and 10 seconds of the first round. It was like a big balloon pop. After the, the one round knockout, Cassius Clay jumps into the ring and starts taunting Sonny. Started screaming at Listed. I think he was calling him Big Ugly Bear or something like that. That was a special night. I enjoyed boxing, the one-on-one -on -one competition, but I was a fan for all sports. I was happy just to be involved and that's how I got involved in officiating. Funny enough, the first time I ever remember being aware of Mark Ratner was on the football field. I played high school football and Mark was a referee. Typically, you would not remember who the referees were in your high school football game, but Mark was so distinctive about how he would ref the game. He had such a presence about him. My goal was always to referee college it was a 19-year career in Division I football. Everything I learned from refereeing football helped me when I became executive director of the Athletic Commission in the state of Nevada. 
Chuck Minker was one of my close friends. Chucky became the executive director of the Nevada Commission. He asked me one day, why don't you get involved in boxing? Why don't you become an inspector for the commission? So I became an inspector full-time in 85, and I would go to every fight to learn about the sport from the back rooms. I was thrilled to be an inspector. In 1991, Chucky took ill. He said, I've been diagnosed with a rare form of cancer. I think I'm going to beat it, but I might need you to, to do some things. And when he was going through the different treatments, I started to weigh the fighters. Chucky passed away in May of 1992, and then I became the director. When you talk about the commission, it was like running a business. There's five commissioners appointed by the governor who would be like a board of directors. The executive director is the day-to-day -day person who runs the whole commission. Combat sports require the highest level of regulation. They require that for a reason. There's a lot more at stake than hitting a home run or breaking a passing yard record or something like that. You're talking about two athletes that are competing against each other where the primary objective is to hurt the other opponent. You know, all boxers know when they sign that contract of the unwritten law that any time during training or boxing, you can die. We all know that. So you need to make sure that all of the safety requirements have been fulfilled. Beyond that, you wanted to make sure that the fight outcome was legit and fair because there's a lot on the line for the state of Nevada and ultimately he's representing the state of Nevada in that role as executive director. In the United States, New Jersey, California, Nevada, Florida, Texas, New York were some of the big states when it comes to boxing. Most states have never had a big fight. They would know the rules a little bit but never had much more club fights. In some commissions, you just might go to some town, and it might be some country local yokel that's all family-related and stuff, and they don't dress the part of some commission people, and they're eating food at the place. It's funny and it's hysterical, but they let you get away with whatever you want. Nevada had built this commission up to where it was looked at as the gold standard. All the big fights were happening in Las Vegas because you had the power and the money of the casinos, and you had the expertise and the handling of all the lunatics in the sport by Mark Ratner. There are all these different constituents that are continually in your ear. So Mark would be taking calls from the competing promoters, the managers, the world organizations, the sanctioning bodies, whether it's the WBC, the WBA, the WBO, the IBF. And somehow, he always came out with everybody feeling like it was a fair process. In boxing or MMA, you have different camps. A lot of times, their camps don't like each other, and you're the middleman, and uh, it was like a peacekeeper, and I just wanted them to know it's gonna be a level playing field. It doesn't matter to me who wins or loses, but we're gonna treat you with respect, but we expect that respect back. If you can deal with Don King and Bob Arum and deal with all the other characters that are involved in boxing at the same time and get to a place where every single one of them will say, Mark's the best in the business, you're doing something right. It's so important to have trust and fairness with the athletic commission. And it's for the fans, especially for the fighters, for their camps, and the betting public. You want people to come in here and trust it. And I think that's, a, that's part of a job as a regulator. Mark became a bit of a legendary figure because when something would go wrong, he was the guy that was front and center. I know he didn't like to be front and center, but in some cases he had no choice. I remember watching uh, uh, Holyfield Bo when the fan man came. Nineteen ninety-three, outdoors at Caesar's Palace, sold out. Riddick Bow finding Evander Holofield for the heavyweight championship. I was watching the fight intently, and the fight's going along fine. I remember it's the seventh round, and there's a sound in the crowd. You know that there's something going on, and there's a buzz. All of a sudden, out of the sky, out of the darkness, comes this intruder. This parachutist with this fan attached to him, and he guided it right into the ring. He lands with his feet over the ropes 
and there was all the Nation of Islam people because Reverend Farrakhan was sitting in that corner. So they were there surrounding. And this guy's caught up in the parachute and they were beating this guy. He had a helmet on, but they were beating him up. He had to go to the hospital. <laughs> the first thing I did was I went right to the timekeeper and said, how much time is left in the round? And that comes from officiating. You gotta know what the clock is. And then I went to each judge and said, look, I don't know if this fight will continue, but if it does, you're gonna have to score this round. Turn your scorecard over, make a note of who's winning the round. They got this guy out of there, but it was 21 minute delay. The fight started again, goes the distance. Holofield won the close majority decision. And the irony of this whole thing is one judge scored that round for Bo, one for Evander, and one called it 10-10 even. If that 10-10 would have been 10-9 for Bo, then Bo would have kept the title, it would have been a majority draw. So that round, in its own way, changed the course of heavyweight history, it changed the champion. That is the most bizarre moment. The bite fight's the most scary moment. Bite fight was the second Tyson Holofield fight. On the night of the fight, I remember I had an uneasy feeling going in. Being at that Tyson Holyfield 2 fight, you could feel the buzz and the energy, but you also felt like something could pop off at any minute. It was a really big time for Mark and Lorenzo. You know, Lorenzo was on the commission. And I learned a great deal from Mark when I was able to have the opportunity to join the Nevada State Athletic Commission, a Tyson Holyfield type of fight where the entire world is watching. Really couldn't have been a bigger sporting event. And the idea there is to try to mitigate whatever risk there is that something could go wrong. Of course, you can't control everything. Crowd was wild. Fight started out fine. There's this butt in the second round, and there's a cut on Mike's eye. We were fighting. I started blacking out. I didn't know what could hit me with the punches all night. And I could take his punches, and he was headbutting me. So Mike is already irate, and, and then in the third round, I see Evander all of a sudden he's jumping up and down. I thought he got kneed in the cup, and he was in pain from that. And then all of a sudden, he puts his glove to his ear. Holyfield was jumping around and going crazy, and a lot of people didn't realize what was going on in the stands. I was mad, and I wanted to get revenge on the next fight. And he started headbutting me again, and that's when I bit him. People were getting calls from people at home saying that he bit Evander Holyfield. The referee, Mills Lane, yelled, hey, he bit him. Come up here. So I had to climb onto the ring apron. And he said, he bit his ear. And I said, he bit his ear? You got to be kidding me. Oh, here comes the commissioner now. They got to figure it out. Well, this is the doctor and the commissioner. They're both he taking a look at it. He bit his ear. I can see the bite mark. Mills said, I'm going to disqualify him. He bit him. And the first question I asked Mills. Tell so me Mark Ratner, head of the commission. Well, let me ask the doctor. In the way only Mark could, just in a real calm way, he was like, are you sure you want to do that? Mills and Lane certainly could say, yeah, I'm sure I want to do that. Or it gave him a second to say, okay, let's think about the brevity of the moment here. Do I really want to stop this fight right here before it really has even started? Mills said, let's bring the doctor up. The doctor examined Evander's ear. Mills asked the doctor, can he still go forward? And he said, yes, he can still fight. Of course, Mills allows us to go on. So now the fight continues and then he bit him again. The second bite comes and then, you know, that was it. All hell broke loose. And so the bell rings and Mills disqualified Tyson. Mills goes over there and he said, fight's over. People started throwing beers and, and, and all this stuff. People were throwing shit, I was throwing shit. And then the ring fills up with policemen and it's a melee. Mike was pushing and shoving and the police were in the ring and they were holding him back. I'm fighting with police in the ring. I'm fighting, trying to fight with a van. I'm outside of the ring fighting some of the fans. I was a little bit irate. There isn't enough security to, to really handle that type of a situation. It was, uh, you know, it was surreal. It was such a big night and that's what you feel bad about. I remember thinking, boy, it's gonna be a bad Monday. So now a few days later after this, we have a commission meeting to, to, to talk about the fight, what the discipline's gonna be. And it was at City Hall. And I've never seen anything like this to this day. 
The streets were blocked off. They had all these antenna trucks and satellite trucks, and there had to be over 100 journalists there. There was so much press. It was a bit of a circus. As a commissioner, I felt a certain level of stress, but Mark, as the executive director, is the front face of the athletic commission. He had fans complaining. He had sports bettors calling and yelling and screaming at him. He had promoters yelling and screaming. He had the networks yelling and screaming at him. Mark Ratner is one of my favorite people. It wasn't his fault. He didn't bite the guy. Nevada was the gold standard of athletic commissions, and Mark was uh, the executive director. You know, they had to make an example of Mike. The commission ended up uh, revoking his license and fining him 10% of his purse. Purse was $30 million, $3 million. I wasn't even mad, I understood. I understood. I thought they were fair, you know what I mean? What I did, I didn't really care about the $3 million. I had so much money, what the hell I care about $3 million for? It didn't affect me that much. It's just that I was mad that I bit his ear. I wish I really didn't buy his ear. Mark was always very well known within the boxing circles, but never wanted to be in the limelight. All of a sudden, because of this big controversy, he was thrust into the limelight and becoming kind of the face of what you think of when you think regulator. I think this is the right thing uh, for him to come here and, uh, and, and get his, uh, his hearing, and we look forward to having this hearing. It was probably a surreal moment at times for Mark being known at that level. I'd rather have the controversy somewhere else than under me at Nevada. It's part of my legacy, the whole thing, part of what made me famous in my own way. The heyday of boxing in Nevada was the 1980s and the 1990s. And back in the 90s, UFC was looked at as um, trash. It was looked at almost like it was a snuff film or something. John McCain had said it was human cockfighting. I saw some videos of the UFC shows, something about no holds barred, anything goes. And I knew that they were doing shows in states that didn't regulate them. The UFC is under the old regime was essentially going to states avoiding regulation. Hey, there's no commission in Colorado, let's go do a fight there. Hey, the commission in Mississippi doesn't care what we do, so let's go do a fight down there. I just never thought it would come to, come to Nevada and didn't pay much attention. And then I was invited to be on a Larry King show. And Senator McCain and I were on one side, and the other side was the former owner of the UFC, his name was Bob Meyeritz, and one of the uh, big time fighters, Ken Shamrock. When he was on Larry King with John McCain, his impression was just, look, there needs to be a, a better evolution of the rules to make sure that it's regulated and the fighters are safe uh, when they're competing. I said very clearly, we're very well regulated in the sport of boxing, and th this sport is not regulated whatsoever. Does Nevada allow it? No, sir. How many nor, states nor do? Nor does any state that has boxing can, commissions. Can we can't regulate a sport that says no holds barred, no rules, two men enter the ring, only one man leaves. It, it was just, uh, it, it was, you couldn't regulate it. Certainly not ever thinking that I would become part of it. So back in the 90s, me and Dana White started training jujitsu, and through that, we met UFC fighters like Tito Ortiz and, and Chuck Liddell, and boom, all of a sudden, we were kind of part of this UFC culture, and we learned that the previous owner was looking to sell the UFC. Within about 90 days, we went from having no experience as far as being promoters to owning the UFC and you know sitting down and saying, okay, this is our vision for what we want the sport to be. The UFC was a mess. It was certainly one of the most tarnished brands in the world of sport, but maybe one of the most tarnished brands in the entire world. Businesses, people say, start you know from the ground floor and they built their way up. When Frank and Lorenzo and Dana bought the UFC, it was like 10 stories underground. The key for the UFC was, could you create a, a, a set of rules and regulations that could be adopted by various state athletic commissions that could take UFC from being looked at as being a spectacle to really making it a sport. The Fertitas bought it late 2000, and the first thing they said, we're gonna run to regulation, not away from it, and most promoters would never think that way. For the commission to regulate the sport, they had to have these rules and educate the commission. There was a meeting that was kind of the most important meeting probably in the history of the sport of mixed martial arts. 
It was in New Jersey. Me and Dana and John McCarthy and Jeff Blatnick met with the executive director of the New Jersey State Athletic Commission. Mark Ratner participated representing the state of Nevada. And in 2001, we formed what is now called the Unified Rules of Mixed Martial Arts. Then I knew we could regulate it. Six months later, we were approved in Nevada. And then from there, a lot of states started to come on board. I think there was so much respect that regulators had for Mark Ratner. It was almost like, all right, if Mark says it's good, I think we can get behind this thing. You think about these things and how important Mark Ratner was to the success of the UFC even before he worked at the UFC. Lorenzo, I remember saying, you know, I'm thinking about bringing Mark Ratner on as a full-time employee of the UFC. I mean, what do you think? Well, is this something that Mark really wants to do? But if he would do it, I thought it would be a great idea for the UFC, for sure. As we were getting ready to take this thing to that next level, and, and obviously we were running toward regulation, we wanted to be regulated by all these states, bringing in somebody with Mark Ratner's experience, credentials, relationships, it would just be much, much easier to speak to all these athletic commissions through Mark Ratner. And I called Mark that day and I said, Mark, I want to talk to you. Can we meet? I want to pitch you on this idea. And he said, let's go to Palace Station and have breakfast. And so I went over there and it's Lorenzo and Dana. But it didn't really dawn on me that he was going to offer me a job. And then I pitched him on the idea as far as coming on, being a part of our executive team, and really heading up this, this process to educate regulators to make sure that we were doing it in the right way. And I said, what do you think about coming to work for the UFC? As the executive director, I felt that I had the best regulatory job in the world. And I never thought about leaving. Now, Dana is a lot more excitable and stuff. He's fired up about it. We think you can make a big difference for us, and we would love for you to come to work for us. And I said, wow, that's, that's a pretty big thing. And I think I had to do a little bit of convincing with Mark. Not that he didn't believe in what we were doing, but it's easy to say, yeah, I want to work for the UFC as we see it here today, this global you know, sports empire. It wasn't that back then. It took somebody that you know, was willing to believe in me and Dana and make this leap of faith with us. I said, well, let me talk to my wife. She was surprised because she never thought I'd leave the Athletic Commission, but I said, it sounds exciting. I can be on the ground floor of a new sport. She said, you know, if you want to do it, let's do it. I told Lorenzo, yes, I'll take it. I'm coming. I wasn't surprised. Mark had been with the Athletic Commission forever. It was time, I think, for Mark to move on to something else. He trusted and respected Lorenzo so much that he knew that this was the right move. I wasn't really aware of how big it would become. I just knew that it could be fun. I could try to help it grow, but never to the extent that it is today. Where the UFC was at the point Mark Ratner was, was hired was searching for credibility. I mean, yes, you get the headline of hiring Mark Ratner, the executive director of the Nevada Athletic Commission, the most experienced regulator in all of combat sports, but somebody had to roll up their sleeves and do the hard work of going from state to state to state to seek regulation of the sport. I think at the time when Mark came on board, certainly there was a number of states that had uh, passed rules and regulations for mixed martial arts maybe to the tune of, you know, 18, 20, something of that nature, but there was still a long way to go. And, you know, we felt like Mark could help with that. By being involved in boxing for so long, I knew a lot of the commissions, and they, they gave me entree into the commission offices. And we would go to these different state capitals, meet with the commissions, and slowly but surely, we're, we were knocking off states one at a time. It was Mark's relationships that drove this agenda of, of getting the sport regulated, because, you know, the proof is what we actually accomplished. And he always had that map in his office where every time a state would pass rules and regulations, you know, he would color it in. And it got to the point where he had the entire United States basically colored in, and the rest is history. So we had all these dominoes fall, state by state. It was exciting knocking off one state at a time to go from 20 states to 50 states, even though it took eight years. Very fulfilling. Well, the UFC Hall of Fame has opened its doors to myriad fighters, figures, and contributors over the years, and we are happy to announce at this time the induction of a man who is just about as beloved as any in the fight game. Mark Ratner should be in every Hall of Fame that has anything to do with combat sports. 
He's a guy that has contributed so much. You know, behind the scenes, Mark Ratner is a legend. To put it simply, Mark is the most experienced and the most respected combat sports regulator in history. And I don't think he's ever gonna lose that title. He's played such an incredible role in the evolution and success of boxing and obviously the evolution and success of the UFC. I like to say that boxing is my older kid, but MMA is my younger one, but there's no reason you can't love them both. There's a, a, a lot of people who think you have to pick one. And I said, no, you can love them both, which I do. This is the fight business. Everybody hates everybody in the fight business. I'm 51 years old. I was 19 when I got in this business. Never once have I heard anybody say anything bad about Mark Ratner, ever, not once. He's just a classy guy. Mark is a gentleman at all times, first class gentleman. I mean, listen, I don't give a fuck about many people, I'm just telling you this. Especially about not too many people that's into boxing. The Mark is, the Mark is one of the shiny stars. Nobody has ever operated at a level that this guy has and was so loved by everyone. I mean, everybody respects Mark Ratner. I'm the president of this company. When I walk these halls every day when I see him, I say, good morning, Mr. Ratner. He's an absolute savage. He's in his 70s, still traveling, still doing everything that we need to be done here at the UFC. When it comes to combat sports, either in MMA or boxing, I've probably seen more rounds than most people. I saved credentials and tickets. And when I look at those, I can remember a lot about the fights. I'm glad I did. I've had a, a tremendous journey. You know, I've seen my hair go from black to gray, but I still love being involved. It's a labor of love.